potassium sparing diuretics so in this video let us see what are the potassium sparing diuretics and how they are chemically related and how they act at the collecting tubules to produce the potassium sparing effect so one of the drug in this potassium sparing diuretic is the amyloride amyloride is having a structure like this and it is having the pyrazine ring system this pyrazine is attached with a guanidine moiety and let us give the numbering to this uh, pyrazine so this is one two three four five and six so now this uh, guanidine moiety is attached at the second portion through the carbonyl group so amyloride is the pyrazine oil guanidine and it is having the amino groups at the third and fifth portion and sixth portion a chlorine group is present so we can give the name of this amyloride as 3,5-diamino 6-chloro-pyrazinoyl quantity so amyloride is one of a potassium sparing diuretic having the pyrazine structure and second one is the triamterene triamterene the name can be remembered as triamino -teridine. So it is having a pteridine ring system with three amino groups. This is a structure of triamterene and this heterocyclic ring system is called as pteridine. Now let us give the numbering to this pteridine ring system. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. We have to start the numbering from the heteroatom and we should not give the numbering to the bridged atoms. Now it is having three amino groups at the second portion, fourth portion and seventh portion. And it is also having a phenyl group at the sixth portion. So the name of this triamterene is the 247 triamino 6 phenyl pteridine. So triamterene is a triamino pteridine with the three amino groups at the second, fourth and seventh portions. Third structure is a spironolactone. So spironolactone is having the steroidal ring system. And it is a steroidal lactone with a pregnin nucleus. So it is a pregn 4 in nucleus with the lactone ring system, which is attached by a spiraling case. And the metabolite of the spironolactone is a candrenone, which is also found classically active. And we can observe this the structure of this candrenone, which is not having a style thiol group at the sixth position, instead, it is having a double bond. So candrenone is a metabolite of the spironolactone. And the related structure is the eplirinone. Eplirinone is again is having the steroidal nucleus along with a lactone, but it is having the two modifications. It is having an epoxide ring. So this epoxide ring is going to differ with the structure of the spinolactone, as well as also having the methyl ester group at the sixth position. So spinolactone is having the estyl thio group, so it, but here it is having the methyl ester group at the sixth position. This drug differs with the spinolactone in the fact that this drug is having the less affinity towards the steroidal receptors. So gynecomastia and menstrual disorders are less pronounced with the eplirinone. Now let us see how these potassium sparing diuretics are going to act. In the structure of the nephron, diuretics act at the different positions. The first one is the PCT, proximal convoluted tubule. And second one is the loop of Henle. Third one is the distal tubule. And fourth one is the collecting tubules at most of the parts including the loop of Henle the sodium is going to be reabsorbed from the lumen through the pumps where the sodium can enter into the systemic circulation but at the collecting tubules the mechanism is different so what is responsible for the absorption of the sodium at the collecting tubules so at the ascending loop of Henle we can observe one of the pump is present on the inner membrane of the lumen so this is the sodium potassium 2 chloride exchange pump through which the sodium can be reabsorbed along with the potassium and 2 chloride. And at the basolateral membrane, another pump is present sodium potassium ATPase pump, which always uh, transports the sodium out of this uh, renal membrane into the systemic circulation. So at the ascending loop of any loop diuretics are going to act. What happens at the distal tubule? At the distal tubule, again, similar pump is present, that is the sodium chloride exchange pump. So this pump is responsible for the absorption of the sodium along with the chloride. So at the distal tubule, the thigh diuretics are going to inhibit this pump. 
In this way, loop diuretics and thiazodiuretics are going to act at the loop of Henle and distal tubule respectively, thereby they inhibit the absorption of the sodium by inhibiting the respective pumps. But what happens at the collecting tubules and how the sodium reabsorption is uh, connected with the potassium levels in the body? So now let us see what is the role of collecting tubules. So this is the collecting tubule. At the collecting tubule, sodium is not reabsorbed through the pumps, but it is going to be reabsorbed through the specialized sodium channels. These renal tubular sodium channels are responsible for the absorption of the sodium from the lumen into the membrane and once the sodium is within the membrane, it can be transported out of the membrane by the one of the pump, sodium potassium ATPase pump. This pump is common in at the basolateral membrane at the, all the locations of the nephron. But once this sodium is uh, reabsorbed, potassium is going into the membrane. Since this is the collected tubules, there is no other mechanism so potassium can be secreted into the lumen. So now sodium is going to be reabsorbed and potassium is going to be lost into the lumen. In this way, as the sodium is reabsorbed, that much amount of the potassium is going to be lost out of the body. Now let us see how this potassium sparing dietics act at this condition. So all we have seen that sodium is going to be reabsorbed at the collecting tubules through the specialized sodium channels. Once the sodium is present within the membrane, it can be reabsorbed into the serum by sodium potassium ATP pump, which exchange the sodium for the potassium. This potassium then can be secreted into the lumen. But this process is going to be controlled by one of the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone acts on the mineralocorticoid receptors and the aldosterone can bind to this mineralocorticoid receptors, then it will express the number of the sodium channels on the apical membrane of the collecting tubules. In this way, aldosterone can increase the number of sodium channels, thereby it can promote the sodium absorption. As the sodium is reabsorbed, potassium is more secreted into the lumen, resulting in the loss of potassium from the body. Now, potassium sparing diuretics can act at the collecting tubules in two ways. Drugs like amyloride and tramtrain, they can act as a sodium channel blockers. So these drugs can directly block the sodium channels, thereby the sodium is not going to be reabsorbed. On the other hand, drugs like the spinolactone and eplerinone can act as an antagonist of the aldosterone receptors, thereby they can inhibit the binding of the aldosterone to the mineralocorticoid receptors. In this way, these two drugs are going to decrease the expression of the sodium channels, thereby sodium reabsorption is going to be inhibited. In this way, potassium sparing diuretics can act as either sodium channel blockers, otherwise they can also act as a aldosterone antagonist. Even the different their mechanism, their pharmacological actions are somewhat similar. Now let us see the pharmacological actions. These diuretics are going to increase the excretion of the few of the important ions. For example, they can increase the excretion of the sodium resulting in the hyponatremia. The increase the excretion of the magnesium resulting in the hypomagnesemia and increase the excretion of the calcium resulting in the hypocalcemia and they also increase the loss of water from the body along with the water sodium is also excreted so they can reduce the body volume so they produce the hypovolemia. Now let us see how they are going to affect the excretion of the other types of components. As potassium sparing diuretics are going to inhibit the sodium reabsorption so sodium is not reabsorbed, instead it is excreted. Since the sodium is not reabsorbed at the collecting tubules, potassium is not secreted into the lumen, so it is going to be spared within the body. So the potassium sparing diuretics are going to decrease the excretion of potassium. So there may result in the hyperkalemia. Similarly, they decrease the excretion of the uric acid, so they can result in the hyperuricemia. So these are the main form class actions of the potassium sparing diuretics. Now let us see the clinical uses. Potassium sparing diuretics can be used in the conditions like the hypokalemia. For example, if you have the drugs like uh, loop and thiazide diuretics can produce the hypokalemia. In such conditions, the potassium sparing diuretics can be used. And in the treatment of moderate to severe heart failure, because the potassium sparing diuretics can decrease the cardiac work, they can be used in the treatment of the moderate to severe heart failure. And in the treatment of hypertension, when our other antihypertensive drugs are not working, the potassium sparing diuretics can be used. 
since these drugs are going to reduce the sodium levels within the body as well as they reduce the body volume they can reduce the blood pressure so they can be used in the treatment of hypertension finally these drugs can be used in the hyper aldosteronism particularly drugs like the spinolactone and aprilinone they are going to antagonize the aldosterone thereby they can be used in the hyper aldosteronism so that's about this potassium sparing dietics which are chemically different but pharmacologically somewhat similar and these drugs can act in two ways either they can block the renal tubular sodium channels otherwise they can antagonize the actions of the aldosterone even the different their mechanisms their pharmacological actions are same they increase the excretion of sodium calcium magnesium and water but they decrease the excretion of potassium and uric acid since they are going to spare the potassium they can be used in the condition like the hypokalemia as well as they can be used in the treatment of heart failure and hypertension and due to the antagonizing effect on the aldosterone they can also be used in the hyperaldosteronism 